What's going on everybody? Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Dishonored 2. Having finally played through the title for myself after reviewing the first game last year, but before we dive into all that, to get my usual stuff out of the way, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it also includes a lot more than that. There's a link in the description below going over everything that I cover, as well as a link to my Steam profile, which is public. That said, for games like this that are quite old and relatively easy to 100% on their own and everything's been pretty well figured out, this one is a fairly simple 100%, especially given the game's shorter runtime. So as these things go, this one is pretty tame. Now, before we dive fully into this, I do also want to caution people that I will be talking about the story at length here, and while I won't be spoiling every little thing, I will absolutely be spoiling some stuff, so there's your spoiler warning. Moreover, I'm also going to be covering Death of the Outsider in this particular video because that is a standalone expansion to this and didn't really feel like I needed to do a whole separate video for that. But from there, let's jump into an overview of what Dishonored 2 is. It is, of course, a stealth-based immersive sim, which its developer, Arcane Studios, are pretty well known for. So naturally, that means we are going to be taking our characters across a fraught adventure, though how we do that is largely up to us. And while there's a pretty big emphasis on stealth, I would say it's hardly your only option. Whether to kill everyone or not is down to you. It's also possible to stealth your way through everything or go in guns blazing, kill everyone, and in this particular game, you can even go in guns blazing and just knock everyone out. But in comparison to the first title especially, Dishonored 2 has vastly, I would say, improved the overall gameplay experience while unfortunately falling a bit short of the first title in other areas, namely the story and interesting hooks. That said, I like to kick off my reviews with a quick note on the technical state of any individual game, and that's no different here, so how is Dishonored 2 running in 2024? The answer is quite well. When the game launched in 2016, the game had a fair few issues, and was quite buggy for many people, you can still find those reviews on Steam even, though these days most of that seems to have been cleared up. Personally, I had zero issues playing through this, didn't run into any bugs or anything like that outside of maybe some clipping here and there. Without so much as even a single crashed desktop. That said though, a quick browse of the more current Steam reviews does show me that it still occasionally has problems. In fact, one of the more common issues that people seem to have now is that every once in a while the game simply will fail to launch. So I wouldn't go so far as to say it's in a perfect state, though nothing ever really is. By and large though, you should probably have a pretty good time playing this from the standpoint of bugs, etc. But from there, let's dive into the difficulty settings. Dishonored 1 and 2 really are an interesting game to talk about when it comes to speaking about difficulty because realistically there's difficulty from your actual gameplay actions and how you're approaching the title from a gameplay perspective but there are also actual difficulty settings. A few different presets which basically make it more difficult to deal with enemies detection or numbers frankly and then there's also custom difficulty settings which allow you to freely access a bunch of different modifiers etc and customize them as you please please for the gameplay experience you would like to have. Unsurprisingly, medium or normal is the default, though you can certainly adjust as needed, and that's to say nothing of changing how you're playing the game. As much like Dishonored, going in guns blazing and just murdering everyone is somewhat of an easier option because of how overpowered your character can get at times, especially if you get used to how the game moves and tackles certain individual elements. However, Dishonored 2 in particular does let you run through the game without using powers at all, in a challenge called Flesh and Steel mode, just to give yourself that little extra boost. So again, difficulty here is all over the place, and in many ways is simply going to be down to you and how you would like to handle the challenges. But from there, let's talk about the story setup and my thoughts on it. So Dishonored 2 takes place 15 years after the original Dishonored, which means Corvo and his daughter Emily have since grown up a little bit. Emily has in fact become the empress of the four island nations at play here. In the interim, between between games, Corvo has taken the time to teach his daughter all of his tricks, basically making her an assassin in her own right, with many of the same skills he himself possessed. That said, Corvo, as opposed to being
being a faceless, silent assassin in the previous title, is now a much more established character with both a face and a voice. Right at the start of the game, however, under the guise of a gift to the Empire here, a duke and his associate, Delilah Copperspoon, stage a coup attempt and take the throne. And right at that moment, you have to choose to play through the game either as Corvo or as Emily, though Emily is, in fact, technically the canonical protagonist, if you will. And truth be told, the story makes much more sense if you play as her, and we'll get to that in a moment. Once this has happened, you must escape your current situation, that is to say, get out of the palace before you die, and make your way over to a ship called the Dreadful Whale, which is where we'll meet up with Megan Foster, and then the Dreadful Whale becomes our hub of sorts in between individual missions, though it is, like the first game, a pretty linear experience across nine missions. At which point, you'll be forced to contend with how you plan on going about rescuing your empire from the brink of destruction. Now, whether or not you choose to kill or simply knock out everyone along your way, or take the non-lethal options where presented, you'll then affect your chaos level. The world can either be in low or high chaos, and this will affect the endings, though in a bit of a different way from the first title. The original Dishonored limited the good ending to a purely non-lethal playthrough, and in that game, that meant you couldn't utilize a lot of the tools the game gives you to, in fact, be the assassin that you are, which created a bit of an awkward problem where the game gives you all these tools and then punishes you for using them. Dishonored 2 approaches that in a few different ways. For starters, high chaos or low chaos only affects the tone of the ending more so than the ending itself. It becomes more of a statement as your effectiveness as a leader than it does the actual outcome. What happens to the areas that you're in, most of the game taking place on the island of Circonos and the city of Karnaka, so what happens to that city and the empire at large comes down to choices you'll make in a few of the missions, basically coming down to who's left alive and thus in charge of the various things. Now, interestingly, this creates a situation where there's quite a few different endings to this game. Technically, there's a high and low chaos ending for both Emily and Corvo, alongside various outcomes based on the decisions you make in a given playthrough. And that's to say nothing of the gameplay changes that is also affected by the chaos level, such as certain enemies, spawning or despawning, being present or not, basically, depending on the overall chaos level. If you choose not to kill anyone, generally it's easier to move through areas because there are less enemies overall, whereas if you're going on constant murder sprees, the world is a bit more hostile, and the number of enemies can almost double at times. But while I would say the story does make some improvements over the approach Dishonored 1 took, for instance, the actual outcomes to the story I was pretty pleased with because you have so many more options beyond just whether or not you killed everybody along the way, but it still does run into a few issues. For starters, I think playing through this game as Corvo, especially the first time, leads to a worse story overall, because he has a bit of a been-here-done-this sort of feel, as this entire plot really isn't that dissimilar from the first one, so he's been through very similar situations. Moreover, a lot of the story and even some of the dialogue feels a bit awkward when you're Corvo, because some of it doesn't necessarily apply. For instance, there's a mission where he talks about seeing how poorly certain areas of the nation have done when in in fact, he has seen that plenty throughout his lifetime. So there's just little awkward moments like that, and because of that overall, Emily makes a lot more sense as the protagonist, which can create some problems right away if you choose to play Corvo first. But that's hardly the only thing, because you'll notice I barely mentioned the main antagonist here, and that's because neither does the game, frankly. Reality is, you could have replaced Delilah Copperspoon with almost anyone, and it would have been the same story overall. Delilah here is actually from the first game's DLCs, where she is ultimately dealt with at the end, though the plot of Dishonored 2 does address that. Overall, though, I'd say she's just not a very compelling villain from start to finish, and that's mostly because she's not in the game. She gets very little characterization, outside of a few different moments that if you've played previous DLC, you kind of already knew, and what little bit is added here just isn't that interesting. So as main villains go, Delilah is very boring. All of that, though, and I didn't even mention The Outsider. The Outsider is the mysterious entity from The Void, Void responsible for giving either Emily or Corvo their powers, if, of course, you choose to accept them. And this, along with some occult elements as well, as Delilah herself is in fact a witch, gives the entire setting a strangely veiled, otherworldly, supernatural vibe at times, and I'm a pretty big fan of it overall. It adds just enough to the story without also being a huge plot hole, as not everything can just be swept away under the rug via magic, though a bit more on the outsider later. 
later, which brings us to character progression. Character progression in Dishonored 2 is a relatively simple affair, largely coming down to your powers, your gear, and bone charms. Now, when it comes to your powers, right away, the first choice here is to accept them or not. Either as Corvo or Emily, after the first mission, you'll be met by the outsider, who offers to return your powers if you're Corvo, but give them to you if you're Emily, though you don't have to accept these. You can choose to refuse them and play through the entire game without using them, which I actually think makes you appreciate the level design that much more. But assuming you choose to accept those powers, they are actually different between Corvo and Emily as well. Corvo gets his powers from the first game, essentially, whereas Emily has quite a few new ones, such as Far Reach instead of Blink or Domino. Domino allows you to link enemies and kill one kills them all, whereas Far Reach allows you to either travel to a location you can see, rather than just straight teleporting there like Corvo's Blink, but it also allows you to bring things to you, which is just an interesting take on how something like a teleportation ability might work. But just getting these powers isn't everything, as they can then be upgraded. This is done by finding runes throughout the levels, and if you choose not to take the powers, the runes instead just give you gold. But if you have the powers, you'll collect these runes and then spend them on upgrades, which can either be passive abilities that help you out overall, or upgrading individual powers and making them that much stronger. But then we have our gear. Gear upgrades is the primary thing we're going to spend all of our gold on, as we are a thief among other things, which means we'll be coming into contact with plenty of valuable items, which we can then, of course, turn into gold, which allows us to upgrade our equipment at black market shops. Replacing the upgrades in between missions from the first title, some missions have a black market shop at which we can upgrade our gear with our acquired coin, which can increase everything from ammo capacity to damage damage on individual things, or simply making individual items more effective, like causing a stun mine to incapacitate more people before burning out. These shops can also be used as a place to stock up on equipment, such as any individual ammunition type you might need, tips for secrets to approach certain levels, or even other things, though each shop also gives you an opportunity to rob said shop if you can find a way to the back, which allows you to get some of these items for free, which is an interesting take. Last but not least for progression, though, we then have have bone charms. We'll also find these throughout the various levels, and equipping them grants the associated effect, though some of them can be corrupted and come with a detriment as well as a positive effect, but one of our void powers happens to be bone charm crafting this time around, which allows us to sacrifice bone charms we find to learn their traits and then craft new ones with whalebone. These crafted bone charms are, of course, much better than their base counterpart because they can have more than one effect on them. This does come with a chance of corruption in many cases, though, which can then add that debuff as well. But bone charm crafting can vastly increase your potential as combat, stealth, or any other thing you want, really, as you can almost quadruple the number of positive effects you have. But now that we have that progressed character, how are we approaching the game? Which brings us to the gameplay and world section. So, through our journey of Karnaka, we're going to be taking a relatively linear adventure across nine different missions. In between, we'll occasionally go to the Dreadful Whale, which serves as a hub and a vehicle for certain story elements, such as finding out the true identity of Megan Foster. But first, let's talk about the island nation of Sirkonos first and the city of Karnaka. This place is a bit of a withering jewel. Since the coup attempt, Sirkonos used to be a vibrant, wealthy island nation that was effectively a bit of a lush tropical paradise. However, at the rise of one Duke Luca Abel, the island began being drained of its resources, leading to widespread problems such as poverty and disease all to fuel a war effort against other islands. So where once the nation was prosperous, it is now being drained dry at the expense of basically everyone. So whereas the original game had a rat plague, Sirkonos is infested with blood flies, as they're called, and you can find more of them as the chaos level goes up, but they will attack you if you get too close to their nests, and they can be a little bit annoying in numbers, though are easily dealt with. These can often be attended by mutated humans known as nest keepers, and can pose a bit of a problem 
problem beyond just the regular guards. And while much of the game still manages to retain a lot of that whale punk aesthetic that they were going for in the first title, via things like the dreadful whale, our ship, and the fact that most inventions run on either electricity or whale oil, but in spite of that, I do think the game loses some atmosphere in between the titles, mostly because Circonos is just less interesting overall, there's not this vicious rat plague going on in the background, the changes to individual levels via the chaos system are a bit more subtle, and while they are there, it's usually much more minor, with some background happening simply being more lethal the higher the chaos goes. For instance, fights that might otherwise be more amicable instead result in death, certain buildings might be covered with blood flies instead, that kind of thing, but overall, the entire thing still manages to retain an almost bright and cheery aesthetic thanks to the setting, which is at odds with the story being told, and it just lacks the atmosphere of the first title, if anything else. But that's hardly the only thing at play here, because then we have the level design. The level design in Dishonored 2 is a fair bit different than Dishonored 1. Mostly, there's just more to it, more of everything. Clutter, items, options, paths, all of that. In fact, I would say the levels of Dishonored 2 are made out of like many weaving paths that circle in and around each other, leading you to various quest solutions, so to speak, that you really only see if you play through each individual mission multiple times with multiple avenues of approach, which is where things like the no powers run come in to force you into those options. As how you have to get past an obstacle when you simply can't blink past it is an interesting approach to individual levels. Levels can often consist of neutral zones and then hostile zones, basically places you are and aren't allowed to be. The neutral areas tend to be teeming with civilians, which react differently to your antics than, say, the guards do, which is a good time to mention that there are more enemies to mess around with this time around, as there are various levels of guards. In fact, if you kill a captain, which is to say the guards with the red shirts, sometimes their followers will run away at their death. There's also wolfhounds and gravehounds who can actually use scent if you're close enough by to track you down, as opposed to just sight and sound. And your job in both the packed level design as well as dealing with enemies is to find a way around all these obstacles that fits your given playstyle. And the game offers you tons of ways to do that, which is really the triumph of the overall level design. And I think this is really high highlighted in a couple of missions that you'll hear often praised with this game, such as the Clockwork Mansion or the dilapidated manor with a time-shifting mechanic. Starting with the Clockwork Mansion, though, as it sounds, this is a mansion that you need to get into that is home to all sorts of contraptions that actively move and rearrange the walls inside. You can choose to navigate this, the straightforward path, or it's possible to actually get behind the walls where all of these changes are happening and sneak your way through maintenance areas, things like that, and reach the end without ever really encountering some of the more ridiculous things you can do there. And those are things you'll likely only see if you take multiple runs at it. But then we have the Dilapidated Manor, which is a mission that really starts the the mission beforehand, which is getting there in the Dust District. The Dust District is a mining part of town that is, as the name might imply, covered in dust, but it is home to two competing factions in a neutral zone. Each of these factions wants the leader dead, and in helping one versus the other, you'll get access to a code that allows you to open the door and move on. It's also possible to side with neither of these and find alternative solutions around, or even deal with these leaders in a particularly brutal, non-lethal way. Giving this mission I think the most character overall, just in the sheer number of approaches you can take. But the manner that immediately follows after this, once you've gotten past the Jindosh lock, is then immediately granted a time-shifting mechanic. You see, what you need out of this manner is actually in the path, and as a gift to you, the outsider offers you the time piece, which allows you to shift between the past and the present, which allows you to navigate this manner to find what you need. And bouncing from the relative safety of the dilapidated manner to the the crawling with guards past version of it as you stealthily try to creep through two different versions of this mansion whilst tracking down loot and everything is a remarkable display of game design because the things you do in the past affect the present of course which means as you alternate these paths you can take actions that then change the layout of certain rooms opening up new or different paths and it really is impressive all the different ways they weaved a lot of that stuff together. 
So when it comes to the level design of Dishonored 2, the word that comes to mind for me is simply dense. There is just so much to each and every one of these levels that despite there only being nine missions, your first time through, if you really want to find everything, you could spend probably two or three hours on each one of these levels just going through and finding all the little details, which you're almost certainly going to do if you're looking for everything, which makes for a game that can be speed ran extremely quickly once you know where everything is and how to approach things or it can be this intricate stealth-based mission where you're just crawling through individual set pieces, getting past obstacles without any powers, and honestly everything in between. And that's probably the most amazing part about this game to me. But that is realistically only because I am particularly bad at the fluidity of movement available to you. So this is not something that's ever really been my strong suit, but one of the really cool things about this game is just how fluid a lot of the actions available to you are. And if you get really good at them, you can pull off some really crazy stuff, which is why you can see all those speedrunning videos on this platform as well. And honestly, I recommend you check some of them out. You can really get an appreciation of some of these levels by watching those. But not only are these levels intricately designed, the ways to navigate them available to you via things like your void powers or simply knowledge of how the movement system works and how enemies will react to things can make for a system where you are just bounding and leaping through the level like it's nothing, leaving guard in your wake. And because that system is so well done, even if you're someone like myself who's never really been good at that kind of thing, you can still make use of a lot of it to deal with some more fast-paced moments like, say, the middle of combat, dealing with guards, or simply sort of parkouring your way through certain areas of the mission. Now, my only real complaint here is that I do think the AI on the enemies can be a little weak at times or just be a little silly to the point where it's like, oh yeah, I'm definitely playing a game. And sometimes you'll be sneaking into areas that are absolutely crawling with guards, but at the slightest sound, they instantly go fully hostile and attack you, which obviously doesn't make any sense. There should be other guards walking around. If you're patrolling a place with 50 other guards, hearing someone walking in the next room isn't exactly newsworthy. And there were certainly times that that just felt ridiculous. But while the world and atmosphere didn't always land for me, the actual minute-to-minute -minute gameplay and how you can approach individual levels, and that's to say nothing of the combat and stealth we're about to get into, is really remarkable stuff, and I think it's where this game is at its best. But speaking of, let's talk about combat and stealth a little bit. For the most part, I would say that they kept the fundamentals of Dishonored 1 while expanding upon a lot of what was available to you. Some of this is done simply by adding more more powers based on the character you're playing, whereas other things simply give you more options and items to play with. For instance, as just a very basic example, it's possible to parry enemies and then knock them out mid-combat now, which means if you're just fighting a couple enemies, this is a great way to maintain your non-lethal status despite being discovered. Though, interestingly enough, if you start choking enemies out mid-combat, sometimes their comrades will just kill them, so I wouldn't say it works against large groups. But then there's all the items at play. We get Get a hand crossbow, which will let us shoot different types of bolts, either just straight up crossbow bolts or sleep darts to put enemies down from a distance, incendiary bolts to set people on fire or the environment in some cases, as there are things that are explosive, and combined with using your powers in unique ways, there really is just a remarkable amount of stuff to do and combine in ways you might not even expect. And that's to say nothing of the fact that you can pick up a lot of items and chuck them, such as whale oil containers, which are in fact explosive or throwing distractions to move guards in the way or, say, onto a planted stun mine which will knock them unconscious or a spring razor which will kill them. But then, of course, there's actual stealth. You do have to crouch to go into stealth mode, which will reduce the noise you make, which is important because stealth is based off of noise and sight, which includes a little bit of light, though that mostly matters at a distance. Now, once you're in stealth, you have a bunch of different options available to you, either the classic choke someone out, kill them, of course, but sometimes being in stealth will enable you to use your powers more effectively which is where playing Emily or Corvo in particular feels quite a bit different. You see, most of Corvo's abilities are great for actual combat. Your blink ability is fantastic for traversal, of course, but things like bend time or devouring swarm allow you to get up close and in the action with people, whereas Emily's, I would say, are better suited for efficiently killing things from the shadows, such as her domino ability that connects enemies, or her far reach ability, which allows you to pull items to you as well. And of all of these options, I think probably my favorite approach is to be what I like to call aggressively non-lethal. That is to say, because you 
can knock enemies out in combat because you can use stun mines and things like that. Mid combat or sleep darts, etc. There's an upgrade that makes those instant. In comparison to the first game, in Dishonored 2, you can do a non-lethal playthrough while being extremely aggressive and really pushing ahead as quick as you can. And while this might come at the sacrifice of occasionally being detected and not doing a perfect ghost run, it does make for some interesting gameplay encounters that just didn't feel like they were even possible in the first title. So when it comes to combat and stealth in this game, I think the really cool thing is just how great all of it feels. And because there's so much fluidity to both the movement and the systems at large, there's a lot of stuff you'll be like, I wonder if this thing would work, and then you can try it, and it usually 9 out of 10 will if your execution is appropriate. And because of this, how much you get out of the combat system is largely up to you. Are you going to utilize those powers and things to their fullest, or are you going to take the straightforward approach of just stabbing everyone in the back from stealth at a snail's pace? Do you want to play slow and cautious, or do you want to run in guns blazing? or frankly anything in between. And that's to say nothing of dealing with the environment at large, such as disabling the various security measures that enemies will use, such as the walls of light, which will kill anything that walks through them, basically shutting down turrets, or even just more indirect things like gathering information on various targets, which will then open up new options to you to approach individual encounters from a different standpoint, which of course comes with your non-lethal options for main targets, but can also simply point you in the direction of a more useful solution overall. So to summarize combat and honestly just the gameplay in general of this game is that it really hands you all of these tools and then you have to make the decision of how to employ all those things in this sort of sandbox mission you've been given access to. And that part is just incredibly fun for me personally, which is where I was having the most fun with this title. But that does finally bring us to our DLC section, or Death of the Outsider. Not technically DLC, as it is a standalone expansion to the main game. So technically a separate purchase, but by and large it is the same gameplay with a different vibe, I would say. You see, in Death of the Outsider, you play as Billy Lurk. Billy Lurk, of course, being the real identity of one Megan Foster from the main game, which you can learn throughout the story of the main title. And Billy Lurk, for those who don't know, is one of the characters from the early DLC via the first game. Billy Lurk is very close to Dowd, the assassin of the Empress from Dishonored 1. In Death of the Outsider, after the events of Dishonored 2, Billy decides that now that she's stepped back into her role as Billy Lurk instead of hiding, she needs to track down Dowd, who has since gone missing. You do so and find out that Dowd's plan was to kill the Outsider, the person given everyone these powers at the expense of their soul, more or less. And he wants to put a stop to it so that here in his twilight years about to pass from this mortal coil, he does not wound up bound to the void forever. And Billy, being probably the only person that he's really close to, vows to help him with this, which is what kicks off Death of the Outsider. And honestly, the name of the game in this case is pretty on the nose, so I don't think it takes much to explain the story there. Nonetheless, though, it is a bit of a different experience. For instance, Billy has her own unique void powers that she gets access to, which allows her to take on the appearance of an enemy for a time known as semblance. Her displace ability is a similar to blink ability that allows her to mark an area and then teleport to it. She also gets an ability called foresight, which allows her to mark enemies and see what they're up to, but she can also use displace and foresight together to blink through enemies, which will explode them, which is certainly a gruesome sight. So she has some interesting gameplay quirks all her her own. But her story through Death of the Outsider is a bit more focused on killing, which means there's not really any chaos levels to worry about, but you can take on mercenary contracts throughout the five missions of this game to really flesh out the levels a little bit more. And that's to say nothing of the fantastically well-done missions in this particular DLC. My favorite was actually the third, which is effectively a bank robbery, which I think the first two games really missed out on, as the bank robbery mission of this DLC is fantastic fantastic. I loved it. There's so many options for just breaking into the bank and then how to deal with it once you're in there, not to mention all the ways leading up to it. And of this entire experience, that mission was hands down my favorite. But overall, Death of the Outsider has a different vibe than 1 and 2, of course, but this is especially true in the last level of this mission, because that one plays more like a different game altogether, where you're kind of forced to deal with enemies in a really tedious way because you can't really assassinate them, and the easiest thing 
to do is just go around, which can be really tedious. And I found that the easiest thing to do if you're not going for a completely stealth run is to simply run past all of them because fighting them is a waste of time. But the ending of Death of the Outsider has pretty big implications for the world and universe, and given the recent leaks of a Dishonored 3 in the works, I think is relevant to point out. Overall, though, I think Death of the Outsider was really cool. It came with unique powers for Billy Lurk, and some really fantastic missions that aren't so focused on whether or not you're killing everyone, which for an Assassin game feels fantastic. But that brings us to our Steam Deck section. Now, happy to report that Dishonored 2 and Death of the Outsider run quite well on the Steam Deck overall. They have controller support, they have cloud saves, which are the main two things you'd want. Given that they have controller support, you can play this game pretty smoothly. Now, personally, this is the kind of game I much prefer the aiming of an actual mouse, but if you got used to the controller scheme here, I'm sure people could be quite good at it. Really, the only thing of note I have to say about the Steam Deck in particular is that when you get to utilizing the game's movement mechanics, that is to say, bouncing through the levels really quickly. Sometimes the game struggles to load and keep up with that, which can kill your FPS every once in a while. It wasn't an issue all the time by any means, but occasionally that was something I ran into. And other than that, though, it ran quite well on the Steam Deck and is certainly a good place to play that given the mission-based structure of the game overall. It makes a lot of sense to me to play this game on the Steam Deck on the go or something. But with all of that said, let's finally talk positives and negatives before wrapping this thing up. Now, on the positive side for me, it was definitely the gameplay and the levels. The minute-to-minute -minute gameplay of this going through individual levels, which are all really cool and many of which have their own unique things going on, makes for some incredible gameplay. It feels great to play this game from a tactile movement and experience with the guards and things. And that's to say nothing of adjusting that experience to your personal preferences via things like difficulty. When it comes to the gameplay of Dishonored 2, I really can't say enough positive things about it. It is fantastic. Unfortunately, though, some other parts of the game I do think let it down. For starters, the story never really gripped me. And while I think Emily's portion of the story is better overall, it's also still just not that great. It loses a lot of the atmosphere just from the change in setting. The main villain is honestly irrelevant for most of the game. You could have replaced her with anybody and it would have been the same story. And those are just a couple reasons why the story and the atmosphere of this game I think are much better in the first title even if the rest of the game is such an obvious technical improvement in many respects. Which brings me to my conclusion. Dishonored 2 is an improvement in terms of gameplay and the technical side of things over Dishonored 1 in a way that is honestly better felt than heard about. Going from 1 to 2 in terms of a gameplay experience is miles apart in difference. Unfortunately, in exchange for that amazing gameplay, you're giving up a lot of the atmosphere and charm of the original game, and even the story felt a bit flat for me personally, though because you have such opposite ends of the spectrum in terms of individual components here, it's natural that I think people are going to disagree about which one is the better game. Personally, while I would say I definitely enjoy the atmosphere and tone of the original title, the gameplay of the second one is unmatched. And if you're not so worried about the story attached to your murderous rampages or ghostly stealthy assassinations, then I think Dishonored 2 is wonderful. Now, when it comes to buying it these days, full price, it's actually a little bit expensive. Both Dishonored 2 and Death of the Outsider are normally about 30 bucks full price, but the good news here is that you can regularly find them on sale as a collection with the first game. I actually bought all all three of them together on sale myself for about 10 bucks total, so you can get some really steep discounts if you wait for a sale on these, provided of course you don't already own them, as it is an eight-year-old game. So if you find yourself wondering just what these games are all about, what they've gotten that praise for over the years, I definitely think they're worth checking out. I had a lot of fun playing through both of these, and I'd be very curious to see how they pull off a Dishonored 3 if we ever happen to actually get one. But that is certainly going to do it for this video, continuing my trend of rehashing old ground and old video games, because like any good YouTuber, I'm certainly not afraid to say things other people have said better and more intricately a thousand times. Nonetheless, though, I certainly hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, let me know how you feel about these titles down in the comment section below. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.